many, many different studies of different patterns. Um, and we also built them physically in order to see how they actually react with natural light. We also tried different vaults um, for structural purposes, but also to see how people can interact with the space. Uh, next. Okay, so when we first started looking at the site around, uh, we kind of wanted to emulate uh, the palm trees and uh, uh, the spatial experience that they provide. We wanted to have that same experience here. So this kind of translates in uh, the column and canopy uh, continuation. Um, so this is how we imagined it to be installed and deinstalled. Uh, every time we work on a project, we also think of the assembly and the transportation uh, because we like to keep our projects practical. So this was how we suggested the installation to be. Um, and this is the final canopy that we had worked on. Uh, these are some more renderings and images of how we imagined the space to be. Uh, obviously, there we had to make some adjustments and simplif simplify the design a bit because of uh, time and budget. Uh, so this is how it is. But we're very thankful for, for Abu Dhabi Art for providing this opportunity. Yeah. And um, so we basically we uh, weren't part of the construction of this. So usually we work when we work on installations, we're part of the. Uh, the design, and then we we basically construct it ourselves. But this one was um, administered by the contractors' projects, which we're also thankful for because um, they basically made it a real thing. So yeah, we're thankful for that. And that's Thank you. talked about um, uh, the the uh, progression and time element in architecture and how important that is. And in this region, uh, there's a big leap from the vernacular to, to the modern. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how this translates in your design? And basically, whether it's a gap or a leap, like you mentioned, um, the way to kind of try to bring what was in the vernacular into the modern, um, the way to do it isn't to get superficial elements from the vernacular, like let's say the Nashrabiya or the courtyard and just mask them onto contemporary buildings. Not to say that they don't work because sometimes they do, but um, it's, about, um, it's about understanding the social factors and the environmental factors that are here today and then responding to them the same way they used to respond to their factors, which is different in every um, part of like time. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I hear as well is that UAE, but the region. Um, interestingly, a couple of days ago in The Guardian, I read um, uh, a quote by John Nouvelle in an interview. He said that we must always be sensitive and contextual, even when there is no apparent context um, referring to the empty plot that was the sand of Sadiat. Um, so th th this idea of context or apparent of no contest or context, um, could you just tell us a little yeah, bit I about... Mean, uh, what, I think what normally when people um, think of context, they immediately think of language and things being out of context. Um, but in architecture, obviously, as designers, context becomes one of our tools. Either it offers... Uh, an opportunity or a, a constraint. Sometimes the constraint could be that there is no context around the site and you're trying to design in, a, in an empty desert plot, but um, those constraints are, are no different to the, the people of this particular place going back thousands of years, hundreds of years, etc., where you look to the challenges of trying to find a habitable enclosure or build a habitable enclosure in a very harsh uh, desert environment with limited materials, limited opportunity to find uh, shelter. And, uh, and as we know, the people of this place did that in a, in a very uh, clever and intuitive manner through the, the coral stone that they found, the sea stone, 
by using trade routes to, to find mangrove poles, etc. Um, today, context adds more to, to the situation rather than just the environmental factors. As we say, we have to think about the, the social implications, the economic implications, and the political implications as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, context, I um, believe it's, it's, it's not just about time. It's also about place, um, it's geography, it's history. <coughs> Um, it's the story that is existing and how to build on that story. Um, um, with regards to um, the bit about rethinking architecture, uh, about 100 years ago when modern architecture started, the premise then was um, for it to help man feel at home in, in a new world, uh, post-industrial revolution, increased mobility at the time through means of transport, cars, planes, trains, and connectivity, it created a new sense of place, a new sense of space, a new sense of time. Um, and a hundred years on, it really feels like we're in a similar cusp uh, where digital technology, artificial intelligence, and 3D printed buildings are also changing our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so with regards to that, um, Selwa and Neda, how, how do you see uh, technology's um, role in reshaping our built environment and, and, and this new kind of world that we're, we're, uh, we're coming into? Yeah, we think that uh the gap that happened between the vernacular architecture and modern architecture could be the result of advancement in, in technology. It could, be, it could be something else. But we believe that uh, technological, uh, technology and technological advancement is, is only a tool and not uh, the driving force. It could be considered as the tool and not the driving force for uh, a design. Uh, we think that it, it helps uh, be have designs that are more efficient, uh, less waste, less time, and are more precise. So it's, it's like a refining tool, but uh, it shouldn't be the driving force that, that is behind the thought of, of a design. Right. Mark? Yeah, I mean, as the, the phrase goes, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I think that as architects, first of all, we should consider the orientation of the building, the materiality of the building, etc., to try and uh, position it and make the building and the architecture perform um, as best it can. Uh, to add to what you're saying, I think we have now to like technological advancements that will enable us to, to create uh, more elaborate structures, but I think that the essence of it should remain the same, that the designer should stay true to make the architecture perform as hard as it possibly can. Rather than using air conditioning uh, to provide cool, why can't we create thermal mass in the building, reduce the apertures, etc., uh, orientate the building to a sun path rather than being reliant on um, artificial lighting to provide those daylighting aspects into the building, etc. So I think uh, as designers, we shouldn't use technologically, technologies as an excuse for a bad design or a, a get-out-of-jail card. Facilitate uh, an idea that an architect has or whoever. But uh, I think maybe in the future, if there's artificial intelligence and a computer can design a building according to data that you place and you put the context or whatever, and then it designs something, then sure. But I mean, for now, it's just a tool for us to use in order to maximize on efficiency and precision and things like that for now. Uh, I think it could also be a means of exploration. So uh, in, in our university, we use a lot of new softwares to kind of uh, as form finding techniques and all of that. So I think it can also bring something new to, to the context or to international architecture and all of that. Mad Mather in the previous um, uh, panel was saying it's the people, it's the faces in these public places. Um, Mark, um, as a representative of government developer, 
how do you see the role of government in helping to build this connection of people to place? Yeah, I mean, obviously our role uh, as our role as the Department of Culture and Tourism is to preserve, promote, safeguard, and showcase the, the heritage and, um, and the culture of, um, of this place. Obviously, there is a unique identity um, to every place in the world, and uh, Abu Dhabi is, uh, is no different to that. And um, as we were talking before, through technologies, we, we have in modern architecture created an international style. And that international style is exactly what it says. It's very difficult to locate a building's um, aesthetics with a particular place in the world. If you look at some of the architecture of Scandinavia, we see um, very uh, high-pitched roofs, obviously, to dissipate uh, the snowfall. We see um, Greek villages painted in white so that it reflects the sun. There is an architecture of this place which is very much about being protective to its people of the harsh... Uh, desert environment. So what we try to do is to look at every single aspect of, uh, of our architecture and try and make sure that it responds to climate but also has a very clear sense of place uh, within, uh, within the architecture. Could you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing for the Cultural Foundation? Yeah, I mean, there it's, uh, it's a slightly um, different um, scenario because in that aspect we are conserving two buildings, two very key buildings. One is uh, obviously a very significant traditional building built with traditional materials, coral stone, sea stone, mangrove pole, date palm, reach, etc. And then the counterpoint to that is uh, a seminal building of the uh, modern heritage year, which is the Cultural Foundation building. And then the challenge with us is to try and find uh, architectural forms or a style which is uh, within the interstitial space between those two buildings, which is, um, what can I say, um, compatible with both the traditional architecture and the modern architecture, but speaks its own language, but still provides very strong sense of place so that it's easily recognizable as being in Abu Dhabi. I don't think it's about going back to the vernacular, I do, because we're not there, so we're here, so we should create something that does what the vernacular used to do, which is respond to climate and social factors, as well as use technology to facilitate. For, for example, there, this is just an example, but uh, we, we know somebody who now creates bricks out of sand using bacteria, and that this is like one, one exploration. Um, but, I mean, we use, we use technology in order to to emulate what, what they did with vernacular architecture and basically giving people what they need before they know they need it, the same way they did in the vernacular architecture. Um, yeah. Obviously, we can't just disregard what has been happening for decades now with vernacular architecture because it was a result of, of uh, finding solutions, architectural solutions that are specific to uh, a context and of the lifestyle of the people. And at the same time, we should utilize what we have now and mix the two to like find a sustainable way to build and to live. Um, and the, the, this call really to go back to, to context, go back to place, go back to um, really reflecting the time that we're in. Um, in a way, creating that, you know, if, if an object is off its time and an object like a piece of architecture is off its time in its place, then it really belongs. And perhaps this is that sense of belonging that, that uh, it can also create to the community. And we, we, we was discussed earlier in creating communities is that sense of um, this is my street and this is my place. Uh, this is my city, this sense of ownership. Uh, I think really only when, when we start to look at um, uh, time and, and building, the, building the, the stories that exist now rather than just ignoring them completely, um, building on that and, and telling these stories but in an, in, interpreting them in a different way, in a new way, 
And I think that's really is the future for this region because um, um, I feel that this this gap is also reflecting in a, in a, in a gap where where the region felt a sense of loss of identity. Um, and now, in order to gain that, I think architecture really has a role to play in in um, uh, firming that uh, sense of belonging. Um, and um, and, and, and allowing this this identity to to, to take place. So um, I'm opening it up to questions. It's quite a big topic. So if you would like to have, ask any questions to the panels, it's, it, it's, it's it's designed to be um, in that location. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's this idea of um, of really understanding the place that you're, you're designing any project in, um, doing the research. Uh, and uh, and uh, celebrating what's there, in a way. I mean, in, in not, not every place has something to, to be celebrated. But in, in, in the case of Maleha, it had a lot to be celebrated. Um, and, um, and allowing architecture to, to create an experience rather than being the form for, for, for its sake. It's, it's allowing uh, buildings to be um, um, not a background, but, but a way to facilitate a, a human experience. Okay, Maleha is a, is a town at the foot of uh, Fossil Rock uh, on the way to Fajera. And um, my practice designed a, 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 an archaeological center that was opened last year. And seen, you know, the evidence of the good, the bad, and the just plain ugly um, uh, around us. Um, what, what kind of level of, of conversation, education, do you think needs to happen in order for those mistakes not to be made again uh, as we move forward? There is... Uh, a, a huge um, difference between one building and its neighbor. Um, so what would I say? Um, I think that has a very distinct sense of place now, as you say, for the, for the language of architecture that we see there. And I, I personally enjoy it every time I, I go there um, to see what, what new forms are, have, a, have arised. Um, but um, for me, going back to what we said before, there are ways of marrying um, our understanding of the architecture of our ancestors and finding technologies that can be used and materials that can be used in a more expressive way to still present us with um, the identity of, uh, of this place, um, but still obviously be modern at the same time. You know, we're not here to try and create uh, false buildings of the past and we're not looking for a kind of neo emirati architecture but there are ways in learning from that and trying to, to come up with something new um, a building for instance in abu dhabi which i'd referred to which is one that we occupy next to castrol hosn if you have a chance to see it which is the castrol hosn visitor center uh, and uh, just drop this it's got a very nice exhibition inside it as well which you should all go and see um, that's my promote uh, point out of the way, is covered with um, uh, a willow wicker uh, cladding on the building, which is representational of Arish, uh, or Barasti, as, uh, as some people call it. Now, that does work very divisively with the orientation of the building and reduces the solar gain into the building. And we did do solar studies on the building when it was designed and found out that actually if it wasn't there, then the extent that the AC would need to be on in the building would be even higher. Um, there are areas within the building which are not air conditioned and they use natural breezes to cool it in kind of escape stairs inside the building. So what I'm trying to say there is we can learn from the way in which buildings responded to the climate, place, um, through their orientation, through the materiality. Um, and they are a modern evolution of traditional materials because obviously we couldn't put a reach on the outside of a building today because we struggle with aluminium cladding with fire codes. So it, it, it's a modern interpretation of that um, to provide that kind of aesthetic identity, sense of place, and preserve the culture 
um, of Abu Dhabi on the UAE. So I don't know if that, that answers your question entirely because it's very difficult to answer it when Dubai is as, as uh, advanced I was thinking as it is. More, sorry, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, and I was thinking more about the, the, the political structures, the, those, those conversations between governmental departments, perhaps. Well, what, what, what is needed there in order for there to be a, you know, a, a better manifestation yeah. of the built environment for people? I mean, it goes, back, um, it goes back to what we were saying before about the leap from the vernacular architecture into to the modern. I wouldn't say there was a gap, but there was a huge leap from going from coral stone, mangrove pole, mud brick, date palm into the concrete era that we see today. And there was a point in Abu Dhabi's uh, evolution where it was decided that there should be more Pan-Arabian motifs in the architecture so that it gave that sense of place, that sense of, of identity. Um, and we are working very strongly with the designers that we work from a cultural point of view to make sure that there are representations or an understanding of how buildings were formed in the past so that that transpires into modern architecture so that we keep that sense of place and that strong sense of, of culture. So speaking from a government perspective, it is a very strong part of our mandate to make sure that we retain that cultural identity. Um, cities are built and it's really encouraging to see uh, the, the, young, the, the, the emerging architects are, um, are on that same wavelength. So, um, yeah, it's, and, and, and the work that we do through RIBA Gulf as well is to really to promote um, uh, the, the, the value of design and the value of, of better standards of education to uh, design and, and to eventually to, to, to the, our built environments in our cities. This, this project I know from that time of the Jean, um, Christian Jean-Claude Award, I was working at ADMAF at the time, and I'd, like, I'd really love it if you guys could talk a little bit about what inspired this, why you chose this very particular form that is very connected to Islamic culture in, in this region, because you're, you're straddling perfectly art and architecture with this. Here is an image of this piece in a desert setting. I think that's, it. that's in Liwa, right? Uh, outside Casa al Sarab. Yeah. yeah. The uh, kind of con contextual is a bit uh, more representational than it is, uh, like we said before, per yeah, performative. So basically, we had to think of a way to. Uh, I had to think of a concept that is inspired from the work of Christo and Jean-Claude, uh, as well as being contextual. So we took, uh, uh, so Christo and Jean-Claude uh, usually uh, have, uh, cover, they cover fabric, uh, they cover structures with fabric, and uh, some of their work is, uh, you find uh, aggregation or scatters of uh, uh, project in, in a field. So the way we translated it in uh, the Arab world is uh, how uh, women uh, are covered with abayas and it's like an art piece. When you see it in a field, it's like you're seeing an art piece. So we wanted to take that element and turn it into uh, something uh, like an, an art piece. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this was an early project we still have uh, a like-dislike relationship with the con concept because, um, I mean, we were able to sell it, but I don't know if, yeah, we, we weren't critical of our work uh, as we are now. Um, it was uh, inspired by fabric, and yes, the abaya in a field um, but yeah, this material is mild steel, so we uh, the way we produce it was we laser cut uh, steel sheets uh, to be able to fold it and create these curvatures. And uh, we also uh, studied, had uh, multiple studies of how the seam is because we, uh, the seam is where the triangulations, where the fold happens. Uh, it emulates the stitching in abayas. And uh, in this culture, it also allows light to kind of uh, 
watch it and to, to show from the inside. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Salwan, I'm intrigued now. What's the dislike? <laughs> Where does that come from? Um, this is a very personal opinion. But um, it comes from basically an image that's been uh, placed sometimes on uh, okay I need to be careful <laughs> one second um, basically we don't just want to make something and say this looks like a tent so this is a tent this is a abaya we took a like a, an, a very um, a symbol. yeah it's a symbol and we don't want to exploit that so this is this is where this is where we're coming from, yeah. Um, motifs that they kind of implement these motifs for a new project, but all I see, like, um, excuse me if I may say, um, we see stickers, we see wind towers on new buildings, we we see new buildings looking like old buildings. We don't see them solving the problem. So um, I'm asking if you can suggest a project in, uh, in the UAE that kind of uh, talks about the, the merging of both the vernacular and the modern, not in this superficial way. First of all, you may see buildings around Abu Dhabi that you say have got stickers and patterns on. I can only speak, obviously, from the, the part of the government that, that I work for, which is the you know, culture and tourism sector. Um, I'd like you to come down and have a look at the Kasral Hossin Centre, uh, which is located behind um, Kasral Hossin, which I'm sure you know very well. Um, that particular building does try to do what you say, really. It doesn't just kind of stick on patterning to try and do it. It does perform um, by its orientation, um, it, even by the, the grid patterning to try and contextualise itself with Abu Dhabi. Um, you'll know Abu Dhabi has two very strong grid patterns, for instance. So I'll, talk, I'll just talk about its orientation first of all so that you can understand where I'm coming from. Abu Dhabi has two very strong grid patterns. It has the kind of uh, zero and 90 degree grid pattern of the city and the Qibla grid pattern, which is obviously the alignment of the, the mosques, etc. This building quite deliberately, as a newbie on the block, deliberately tries not to sit on either of those two grids. So it's kind of suggesting that it's a temporary structure on the site um, and not a sense of permanence locked into either of those two city grid patterns. Secondly, the outside of the building does try to be representative of Arish and do what Arish did in the time, which is channel the breeze into the building where the breeze is needed and also to provide shading on the outside. And we did do a thermal study of the building and they are positioned where the building would get the hottest to provide shade and there are eye-lit windows on the building to allow minimal apertures outside to focus views and to allow daylight in without direct sunlight coming inside the building as well. Um, the staircases in the building are not air-conditioned spaces, so we're trying to be sustainable in that part of the building as well. They're pressurized for, for um, smoke ventilation and egress through the building, but we're, we're definitely not trying to air-condition spaces which are not habitable spaces and use the natural elements to try and cool the building down. There are thickened elements in the building as well to provide thermal stores, to provide deepened mass in there, the same way that the coral stone walls of Kasserol Hossin are 600 millimeters thick, built with coral stone, a porous material, absorb the heat of the day and allow that cool back into the building at night time. So that's one example. Um, there are others around the city as well. If you, if, you, if you look around, some of them are slight patternings to them where you do see mashrabiya, but also if you look at, say, Central Market, where you can see the ziggurat form of the souk side that tapers down to provide those uh, uh, views across the city and open itself out into to natural daylight. There are examples out there, um, and I'm sure that if we went back to where we started with the Louvre, we'd even say that there are examples there as well. We've got a domed surface to reduce the surface spread of heat onto the building. The roof is almost a mashrabiya to provide privacy and to provide layering of light inside the building. The narrowness of the structures that form the galleries bring the breeze through the same way that the Sika and the Saha did in traditional old Abu Dhabi. So there are there, but I can't control everything. <laughs> Thank you.
think the winning this prize will have on your careers? Um, do you plan on continuing to work together? And what's next? We're very excited because it's in a scale that we haven't worked with before. Uh, so it, it was uh, an incredible experience for us to, to understand all the considerations that we have to think of uh, in order to uh, design an enclosed space that can ac actually function. Because all of our previous work was uh, open, uh, more, more like art pieces, their pavilions. So it was, uh, it was different. We, we learned a lot through this experience. I mean, we hope to work on more projects like this, of this scale, and maybe even larger. Um, hopefully this time we'll be uh, supervising <laughs> the whole process. But uh, yeah, that's about it. If there's no more questions, I think we've, we've uh, come to the end of our session. Uh, thank you very much all for, for uh, your engagement for this past hour. And thank you, Selwa, Nada, and Mark for, uh, for being here and for, for an interesting discussion. Um, thank you again to British Council. And I don't know if Munir is here, to, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi Art for facilitating this.